This part of France looks suspiciously straight, almost unnatural. But why? A perfect coastline, a triangular forest, and sand dunes that rise out of nowhere. Simply, this isn't nature's design, it's humanity's bold attempt to tame a wild, swampy coast. And the story of how they did it will change how you see forests forever. Before this video ends, I'll show you proof that French shepherds really walked on eight foot stilts, why they literally tried to introduce camels to solve their desert problem, and the secrets hidden within the trees that the military doesn't want you to know. Meet the Landies, a million acre forest in southwestern France that looks like someone drew it with a ruler. But here's what's really wild. This forest is so geometrically perfect that you can see the planning grid from space. Every road, every section, every boundary follows a mathematical precision that is rarely found in nature. 200 years ago, this entire region was basically uninhabitable wasteland. We're talking swamps, sand dunes, and terrain so treacherous that shepherds had to walk on stilts just to cross it. These weren't just tall walking sticks. We're talking about stilts that put people eight feet in the air. Shepherds would spend entire days elevated above their flocks, watching for wolves and monitoring grazing from the aerial vantage point. But more on them later. To understand why they needed to reshape this entire landscape, you first need to understand just how desperate France was to fix this place. This was one matter they couldn't afford to wave the white flag over. Picture this, it's the 1800s and you're looking at one of Europe's most miserable regions. No, not London, the Landes, a semi-desert, a place so dry and barren that French officials literally tried introducing camels. Yes, camels. In 1808, they imported dromedaries from the Canary Islands, thinking that if camels could survive in deserts, maybe they could make this wasteland productive. The experiment failed spectacularly when the camels couldn't handle the European winters. But could you blame them? And here's where it gets weirder. This place was simultaneously a desert and a swamp. Summer brought drought and shifting sand dunes. Winter brought floods that could trap entire villages for months. The few roads that did exist would disappear underwater every winter. Mail couldn't get through. Trade was impossible. Entire communities would be cut off from the outside world for half the year. Sheep grazed on scrubland that barely supported them. Local farmers lived in some of the worst poverty in France. This wasn't just an environmental problem. It was an economic disaster affecting hundreds of thousands of people. Something had to be done. And when Napoleon III came to power, he had an idea so audacious, so expensive, that it would reshape the entire geography of France. The method they chose? It's still controversial today. In 1857, Napoleon III signed a law that would plant over 2 million acres of maritime pine trees. But this wasn't just tree planting. This was environmental engineering on a scale never attempted before. This was like Team Trees before it was cool. Here's how the plan worked. Maritime pines have incredibly deep root systems that act like natural pumps, sucking water out of waterlogged soil. Plant enough of them and you could literally drain an entire region. But the genius was in the details. They didn't just plant randomly, they created a grid system. Drainage canals every few hundred meters, roads following precise geometric patterns, and specific tree spacing calculated to maximize water absorption. The engineers figured out that each mature pine tree could absorb up to 40 gallons of water per day. Multiply that by millions of trees, and you're talking about moving rivers worth of water out of the ground and into the atmosphere. The plan would solve three problems at once. Eliminating the flooding, stabilize the sand dunes, and create a timber industry worth millions of francs. On paper, it was brilliant, but the scale was unprecedented. They were essentially redesigning the hydrology of an area larger than some entire countries. What could possibly go wrong? Everything, as it turned out, but also nothing. And that paradox is what makes this story so fascinating. The transformation took 50 years, but the results were almost magical. Swamps became solid ground, sand dunes stopped moving, and slowly an entire ecosystem was reborn. But as the forest grew, something unexpected happened. The artificial ecosystem started creating its own weather patterns. The massive tree canopy began generating localized precipitation, making the region even more stable. 
This effect, while not fully understood at the time, would later be recognised as one of the key benefits of large-scale reforestation. By 1900, the Landis had become France's timber capital. Towns that barely existed became industrial centres, and the region went from economic disaster to economic powerhouse in a single generation. But to understand the full scope of what they created, we first need to solve another mystery. Why does this coastline look so unnaturally perfect? The answer lies beneath the waves. This coastline is almost too perfect to be natural. And that's because it isn't entirely natural anymore. For thousands of years, ocean currents have been carrying sand north along this coast in a process called longshore drift. Before the forest, this sand would blow inland, creating massive dune systems that shifted with every storm. But the pine forest created a wall. Suddenly, all that migrating sand had nowhere to go but up. Meet Dune du Pilat, the largest sand dune in Europe. This thing is 350 feet tall, nearly two miles long and still growing. It's literally eating the forest behind it, swallowing entire mature trees every year. But here's the mind-bending part. This natural wonder exists because of that artificial forest. Without the pines acting as a barrier, this sand would have blown inland centuries ago. The dune and the forests are locked in an eternal battle, and tourists, of course, flock to watch. Millions of people visit this natural marvel every year, never realizing they're witnessing the side effects of one of history's largest environmental engineering projects. But before this transformation could happen, an entire way of life had to disappear, and the evidence of what was lost is more remarkable than you might imagine. Remember those shepherds on stilts I mentioned? Here's the proof they really existed, and their story is even more incredible than you think. These are real photographs from the 1800s. The stilts, called chasse in French, weren't just practical tools. They were the foundation of an entire culture that lasted for centuries. These weren't simple wooden sticks, no, they were carefully crafted, often passed down through generations, and came with their own techniques, competitions, and social hierarchies. The best stilt walkers could run, jump, even dance while eight feet in the air. Shepherds would spend 12-hour days on stilts, covering miles of marsh while watching their flocks. They developed a unique knitting technique, creating clothes and blankets while walking. They could spot wolves from incredible distances, and coordinate with other shepherds using calls that carried across the wetlands. This wasn't just a few isolated individuals. Entire communities lived this elevated lifestyle. Children learned to walk on stilts before they could probably walk on the ground. They were the ATATs for the French. This tradition still survives today, only it's at local festivals, mostly at performance. Sadly, those practical skills have died with the marshes. Which raises a question that might make you uncomfortable. Was eliminating this unique culture the price of progress, or was this cultural extinction justified by economic development? The answer might depend on what you discover when you look closer at what replaced it, because this forest is hiding some very strange secrets. If you know where to look, this forest hides some bizarre mysteries that most visitors never see. See these perfect circles and geometric shapes scattered throughout the forest? Those aren't clearings, they're bombing targets. The French military uses parts of this artificial forest for live fire exercises. Imagine hiking through what you think is pristine nature and stumbling onto an active bombing range. In fact, large sections of the forest are completely off limits to civilians. There are underground bunkers, weapons testing facilities and training grounds scattered throughout the region. But here's what's really wild. Some of the most ecologically diverse parts of the forest are actually inside these military zones. Because they've been protected from logging and development for decades, they've become accidental nature preserves. Researchers have found species in the military zones that have disappeared from the publicly accessible forest. These bombing ranges have become wildlife sanctuaries. And along the coast, the forest success created an entirely different kind of secret world. Towns like Hosegor became world-famous surf destinations, but research reveals there's a dark side to this paradise that locals rarely discuss with outsiders. The same reforestation that created this playground also created deep social divisions. Property values skyrocketed, 
traditional fishing and farming communities were priced out of their own homeland. Generational families who had survived the marshes, the poverty, the isolation, were ultimately defeated by their region's success. The forests that solved one problem created entirely new ones. But perhaps the most serious unintended consequence wasn't social, it was environmental. And it's a problem that's getting worse every year. Here's the hidden cost of this artificial paradise. It's a tinderbox waiting to explode. Monoculture pine forests don't just burn, they explode. Pine resin is essentially liquid fuel, and when these forests catch fire, they burn at temperatures that can melt metal. In July 2022, massive wildfires swept through the Landes, destroying over 20,000 hectares in just a few days. The flames moved so fast that firefighters couldn't keep up. And here's what makes it worse. Because this is essentially a crop, not a natural ecosystem, when it burns, there's no biodiversity to help it recover. Natural forests have dozens of species that can regrow after fires. This forest has one. After a fire, you're left with empty, blackened earth waiting for humans to replant it. Without constant human intervention, the entire region could revert to the original wasteland. And with climate change making fires more frequent and intense, some experts are questioning whether this artificial ecosystem is sustainable long term. Each major fire costs millions in damage and threatens the entire regional economy that depends on this forest. The very solution that saved the region could be its downfall. Which brings us to the bigger question. In our rush to control nature, what have we actually created? The answer might surprise anyone who visits this place today. Today, millions of tourists visit the Landes to experience nature. They climb the Great Dune, hike through the ancient forest and surf the pristine coastline. But almost everything they're experiencing is artificial, a theme park of nature born of man. The forest is younger than the US. The dune exists because of human intervention. Even the straight coastline is partly shaped by our attempts to control it. Most visitors have no idea they're experiencing one of the world's largest environmental engineering projects. The region now makes more money from tourism than from timber. People pay premium prices to experience artificial nature that they believe is authentic. This isn't the only place on earth that's like this. From the Netherlands polders to Singapore's gardens, humans are creating artificial landscapes that feel more natural than actual nature. Maybe that's exactly what makes places like the Landes so fascinating and so important to understand. So what is this place really? Is it nature? Is it art? Some kind of theme park? Is it a warning about what happens when humans try to redesign entire ecosystems? The Landis Forest proves that humans can literally reshape geography on a continental scale. We turned a wasteland into a paradise, solved flooding and poverty, and created one of Europe's most iconic landscapes. But we also erased an entire culture, created new environmental risks, and built a natural wonder that requires constant human management to survive. As climate change forces us to make even bigger interventions in nature, from massive reforestation to artificial reefs to weather modification, the Landis experiment becomes a crucial test case. What worked? What failed? And what can we learn before we start reshaping entire continents? So here's my question for you. What other places do you think are more human than natural? And as we face the climate crisis, should we be doing more projects like this? Or something else? Is artificial nature still nature? Or have we created something entirely new? Something that's neither natural nor artificial, but a hybrid of both? Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you want to see more stories about our weird and wonderful planet, hit that subscribe button. We found dozens of fascinating stories just like this one, and we can't wait to share them with you. Thank you.